yeah i think we'll wait for a couple of more minutes we're now into week 8 of the course Does anyone have a favorite module so far, or something that they really enjoyed in the course so far? Or oh, you didn't like any uh, of the modules? Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what did you say? I didn't quite hear it. So here you know. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yes ma'am yeah i was just asking if anybody enjoyed any particular module a lot during the course so far or anything that was really interesting so far population ecology and community ecology okay that's nice yeah i think uh, these lectures were even i enjoyed quite listening to these lectures okay so we have a very low turnout today i wonder why one's about biology and bird facts i thought govin all of them are biology and bird facts Not really, ma'am. I mean, if you actually look at the modules, uh, rather a substantial amount of them involve statistics, math, and uh, uh, well, I know it's say unrelated, but it's not specifically about that. Okay. My interest lies in the biology and bird facts part. Yeah, but the thing is, behind ecology, you always need to have some statistics to uh, back you up. in whatever you are doing otherwise um, yeah it all just uh, i mean of course natural history notes are also very valuable but to make inferences you do need to do some stats but sure well uh, as far as interest go I'll, i love the natural history part the natural like, history part yeah like history uh, like a uh, certain like migration and uh, evolution and uh, anatomy parts and the uh, and uh, and the mixed species clocks as examples along with the others sure. but not i wasn't too uh, into the uh, the data analysis part or the uh, st- you know all the Stats, methodology math, parts right sure sure yeah sure And what about Rajeshri? Did you find anything particularly that you liked, or enjoyed, or that stood out for you? Okay, really, like we're only three people. I'm wondering. Uh, was there like a notification for this or should we just start i'm not i'm not really sure uh ma'am maybe just people are late okay uh yeah i'm not so sure what to do there i think the last time there were at least some 10 to 15 people since the uh Weeks are coming to an end. Maybe we decided to uh, prioritize uh, the modules alone. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. In in fact, I think for this course we have a lot of sessions, so I can imagine several hours per week for this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh, let, I'll just bring up the first question, and we can see if others come in. We can. Go over some things again. 
all right okay so uh, when you walk along a trail and you count the number of vocalizing individuals of a species what is that type of what is it called is it called a roost count is it called a total count is it called spot mapping or is it called a nest count for three okay I think okay everyone since there are just four people everyone probably can take a guess Okay, so yeah, you have gotten the right answer. It is actually uh, uh, the option number three that is spot mapping. So, what exactly is spot mapping? It's listening to vocalizations of birds, mm -hmm. especially males, since males tend to vocalize more for territories, and uh, using the vocalizations to uh, place the number of territories in an area and thereby. Come up with an estimate. Uh, come up with the population. Right. So, what is this actually a part of? It's a it's a type of census, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, what are the types of census? What is a census first of all? And what are the types of census that you can do? A census is the uh, the listing of the uh, birds in a particular area. Under the assumption that all the all the birds uh, type, bird species types, and the individuals can be covered in a specific area, mm -hmm. the types the types include um, uh, total count, roost count, uh, roost or uh, roost or nest count, and uh, spot mapping or uh, vocal count. Right. Vocal count is used to come up with spot mapping, right, ma'am? Right, call counts actually, yeah, close enough, call counts and a type of call counts is known as uh, spot mapping, that's right. So what happens in a total count actually? Total count is when all the whole population seems to be bunched up to a, an area or seems to be focused in a particular area and, and the, it becomes easier to count the number of individuals in that said area. like. Say flamingos in a lake. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, like uh, as you can see in like wetlands or uh, during like a water bird census, when you can well try and possibly see all individuals congregated in an area, then you can do like a census. Uh, census can be conducted by direct counting or by indirect counting. Direct counting methods, individuals are seen and counted, whereas an indirect counting method, evidences left by the animals are recorded to estimate the population. Uh, could you give me some examples of indirect methods? Yeah. This census is operates under the assumption that uh, all individuals and all the types of species can be recorded. Uh, right. Can in, can indirect methods really be used? Yeah. So I'm actually not sure of this method. Uh, Saptashi, uh, where have you like uh, read about this? I'm not exactly sure if that is a method for uh, census 
to ca- calculate us pellet counts and tigers mm, i'm not really i i am not familiar with this but uh, yeah i mean we could look up and see okay that's that's interesting have you been a part of such a census or uh, have you read about it can can such a count be considered census or are they considered as some other way of uh, okay so saptarshi has read about it yeah i am uh, i'm not really sure about this so yes you do have population estimation and everything with like given things like camera traps but uh, yeah i am not sure about uh, the census bug mark technique sure yeah mm. yeah i think because camera traps uh, do they do do tiger senses with camera traps okay that's interesting uh, but yeah i still need to uh, confirm and read up on it uh, what about roost comes how do roost comes work when the birds come back to roosting in a particular area uh, they uh, roost the z researcher waits and counts them when the roosting time Are you familiar with any like birds that roost uh, near your house or near urban areas? Like this is open to like everyone, anyone, any particular species of birds that you have seen roosting? I have not birds, but I have seen bats roosting. Yeah, sure. Yes, bats do roost. Bats do roost. Uh, I'm not sure if you have seen these uh, uh, egrets or. herons pond herons they, i live near a river so i've definitely seen them but i have never seen them roost okay so yeah you will find them in like large congregations over trees even uh, if you are in any urban space uh, you might also see a huge number of uh, common mynah they also roost during the non breeding season and they roost in these huge uh, sometimes bamboo clumps or trees where uh, we have recorded up to uh, 800 700 to 800 individuals in one single roost so yeah it's uh, it's a pretty large thing okay so uh, let's move on uh, so what are the limitations of census based techniques and counting birds they operate under the assumption that uh, uh, only the the total number of individuals the total type of species in a in a habitat can be com- covered right right and then what are the things that could affect this so basically uh, why are you not able to uh, count all the species in a particular area at a time so sometimes again we, the assumption being that uh, The entire habitat can be covered, but this is not obviously very practical, especially okay. in dense. Okay. So area limitations, you can't cover the entire area. What else? The uh, species itself might be discreet, secretive, very hard to find. Sure. Yeah. And the uh, abundance itself, it may not be feasible to actually count or keep track of all the individuals or species. sure uh yeah you don't know if you are like recounting them or unless you have some photographic method of uh, counting the individuals and of course they do uh yeah move as well so and also it depends on the uh it also depends on the time of the year the census is being done right for a particular species so it will vary and uh, you need to also choose uh the time of the day when you're conducting such a thing so you can't like go in the probably mid day and do a census or if you're doing like a um water bird census what would you take into account like not at a river but if you're doing it at the uh at the coast like a marine water bird census what would you keep into account Uh, 
rain whatever it is yeah so rosbey has uh, said the correct thing yes you need to know the tide timings right and when would you do this based on the tide <laughs> that's a debate uh yeah so as harini said you would do it during low tide because uh, it's during low tide that most of the mud flats get exposed and you have maximum number of individuals so even if you're looking at birds that have long legs like for example uh let's say flamingos or something like that uh it is during the low tide period that uh, a large number of uh, birds are congregated uh not fish abundance they should be able to stand in the area right so if the tide is very high they don't have ground to stand and forage in that in the mud flats so yes they do forage in like shallow water also yeah man i meant like for example if fish are very low abundance there they might not come uh, come to that big part and like so usually i mean like assuming that you are in an area which has a high abundance of these birds uh, let's say for example i'm not sure if you are aware of the mud flats in bombay uh, mumbai that the shivri mud flats or the thane creek or something like that or even uh, point kalimar in tamil nadu uh, they have a huge congregation of flamingos and this happens uh, during some part of the year so they start coming in uh, i guess during like november december so jan feb is kind of like the peak season where the, it is that like the highest number is there and you usually when you going for count you usually go during low tide um, and uh, that's when the water is like a little bit uh, the water has receded a little bit and then you will have maximum number of flamingos so during high tide you do find some flamingos that are in the area but they are mostly just like floating around or they are they've moved to some other uh, area with less of water so yeah so all these factors uh, are quite important in uh, conducting a census and uh, yes as uh, you mentioned govin the major uh, limitation is that uh this is under the assumption that all the birds will be counted um a uh, wood mangroves also be a good example sorry wood man wood mangrove wood mangroves also be a good example uh for uh, as in timings uh mm, like in terms of are you asking for flamingos or like not like not flamingos in terms of high tide low tide and timings Uh, yeah yeah of course i mean like uh, um that so the community of birds in mangroves versus these open mud flats is quite different because you can have even uh, perching birds in mangroves that perch on the mangroves and forage there but uh, yeah it depends upon the species you are uh, choosing to study for a census so a census would be species based right but if you are doing like a diversity thing or a species richness uh, assessment of the community then you could yeah pick different habitats and yes uh, it would uh, the tide would affect your uh, presence or uh, absence of species yeah and by mud plains or mud flats you mean uh... Uh, you mean the uh, the mud plains in a uh, coast of the beach right now uh yeah not like a, i mean not like a sandy beach but more like a rocky beach but uh, don't flamingos usually uh, roost and nest in more lake like areas i don't think they, they the yeah beach. they roost there but they forage in these uh, marine like estuary like areas or in these mud flats once the low tide goes back so uh it's like a it's like a clay soil kind of thing it's like those mud flats where you find mud skippers and other such things out there and you find like a huge number of waders such as sandpipers uh plovers um then you have a lot of migratory like migratory birds that mostly come and forage there 
so yeah it's a huge congregation of these birds uh not many ducks as such uh, near these mud flats uh you might find gulls etc uh yes migratory water birds definitely uh if you're looking for ducks and uh dabblers you will probably uh need to look at some lakes or some enclosed water bodies yeah very rarely in the marine sea as such at least close to the coast Um, mud flats can be found in uh, lakes too as well right now uh mud flats can i not if the uh, so if, if there's no water receding and uh, uh, what do you say rising and receding you won't have a mud flat right uh right yeah. well i've seen flamingos uh, forage in lakes as well yes right? they do but those are usually like shallow lakes so that's like where they can stand so usually if it's like a man made lake or something like that uh towards the center of the lake it will be quite uh, um uh, deep but towards the boundaries of the lakes or especially like creeks you will find these flamingos there and they usually rest to when the water is like really high so you will see them just floating around in bunches uh okay i will move on to the next question so when all the individuals can't be counted via census technique dash techniques are used uh yeah you could put your answers in the chat box so everyone says it's sampling techniques could uh, someone like to elaborate on what are sampling techniques exactly uh yes sachin go ahead so in sampling we are uh, first of all either estimating or assuming the distribution okay and then we may not be able to go to all the places or uh, locations in that particular area and we may not be able to uh, see all the individuals but within given regions uh, we uh, lay out, i mean like the layout of lab about how do we keep uh, sampling the data for yeah. this uh, population and then based on our assumptions we devise a formula saying this particular region has so much uh, uh, count then we extrapolate that to other counts based on the distribution plus also um uh, based on the location and directions of those uh, sighted individuals or species uh, we we take that into consideration for the total count right okay. so so what is like one important thing that is uh, taken into account when you use sampling methods Do you mean an assumption? Uh, sorry, what assumption? Do you mean an assumption is taken into account in sampling? Uh, not an assumption, but uh, there is some important thing that you need to account for. Whenever we go for uh, sampling, sa- uh, sampling, uh, the individual will be present there, and the uh, distribution is. a particular like what i mean either it's a uniform distribution if we are doing that way or could be whatever but distribution and the timing i think is what we are accounting isn't it okay uh okay Do so sampling bias uh yeah vedang has also mentioned that uh not a sampling bias there is something so let's say this can differ from species to species so that's a hint What is the question? I was asking. Do you mean uh, so nature of the species? So I was asking, what do you need to? What is something very important that you need to account for when you are carrying out a sampling procedure? 
of uh, nature of the species as in that they are more, uh, uh, how do I say, they are easy to detect, not easy to detect. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think what I mean uh, at a very general level, what we need to ensure that uh, is that the, your sample actually is representative of the population that you are studying. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so because of which you may have to take many things into consideration based on the context. Yes. Sure. Yeah, you will need to take into account uh, the habitat type, etc, etc, like there are a lot of things. Uh, but yeah, uh, random sampling versus systematic sampling, sure, that is something you might need to take into account as well. But uh, I was actually going for what uh, Govind mentioned, which is the detection probability, right? So the probability of detecting a species or uh, like while it is present but not detecting it or uh, 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 actually like it being present and you are not including it right so a detection probability or that factor needs to be included in your sampling technique and um, yeah we'll, co we'll cover that more um, as we move on with the slides but yeah detection probability is something very very important so, uh, so yeah, going into what uh, Rusebe was also suggesting, oops, Okay, sorry. Uh, am I back? Yes. All right. Yeah, I don't know. Like this current seems to be going only on Tuesdays now between six to eight. Otherwise, there is no loss of current here. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like really badly timed because it used to be Saturdays, and I don't know. Like this is the second time it's happening here. Uh, okay, so what are the important factors that uh, need to be accounted for during sampling and uh, I was going along the lines of what uh, actually uh, Rusebe was mentioning earlier. So would you like to elaborate more on that? So I think it's as uh, Saptashi has said, uh, the sampling has to be random and when we say random we mean specifically in uh, terms of uh, uh, sampling techniques where random would mean that it's uniform, that uh, I mean uh, every, uh, that, the that the units that you sample should be representative of the population and uh, I think uh, as Dr. Kadev had mentioned something about, you know, the, the, uh, there should not be more similarity between the units that you sample than would be in the uh, units in the population as a large uh, on the whole. Right. Yeah. Uh, I forgot, uh, I forgot the term, what that thing is called. <laughs> Uh, replicates? Uh, yeah, not rep no, not replicates. Uh, it's a kind of bias. <laughs> it's slipping my mind. What that term? Pseudo replicates. Uh, yeah, yeah, pseudo replicates. Yeah, pseudo replicates. But yeah, I was going for another term. But sure, yeah, pseudo replicates work when you are over uh, overestimating based on your choice. Yeah. And also when you're doing for sam uh, when you're doing any type of sampling, you need to, uh, uh, what else do you need to account for? Basic things. Uh, selection bias, I'm not really sure what that means. Detection probability? Uh, uh, sure, detection probability, but in terms of uh, when you are going to sample. 
the storage in i mean the availability of the birds during the time we are sampling right yeah right so the time of the day is really important right where when you are going to yeah. be sampling uh yeah. you need to consistently do your sampling so if you are saying i'm going to study birds in shola grasslands versus shola forest uh, or whatever shola forest across two landscapes i will have to do my sampling in a particular window every time i go everywhere right so uh, uh i will i will make sure if um, i am doing four replicates of a place i do those four replicates during that particular time frame only if i'm sampling from 8 to 10 in the morning everywhere i'm sampling 8 to 10 in the morning and the four replicates that i do like i revisit the place it has to be between 8 to 10 in the morning or if i'm doing uh, if i feel that uh, i won't be able to capture uh, all the uh, diversity or species richness during the morning i'll also do something in the evening right but then i have to make sure that my evening replicates and morning replicates are uh, consistent across all these plots that i'm sampling in the entire area and what else do i need to account for Now our effect on the sample, for example, if we might if we we might scare away certain. Ah, uh... uh, sure. Ah, uh, so that is going to be uniform in all the plots, right? Because you are going to be physically present in all the plots. What you But... need to account for, ah, uh, like what else in an ideal situation? Um. Also, uh, we might have different effects. Like sometimes birds might be attracted to our presence, and sometimes repelled by others. Uh, let's say you are sampling a forest that where, uh, like, they are remote areas. They are not close to urban settlements. Isn't it really feasible to totally eliminate the sampling bias in field studies? Uh, you 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 can't eliminate it, but you can account for it. yeah so vidhan says area terrain or habitat yes that matters sometimes if you're doing random sampling and you drop plots uh you end up in areas where uh the terrain is not suitable for you to do it right so you need to uh sample alternate plots in that time uh habitat yes uh, assuming that you are uh, all your plots are laid out you have graded up habitat that includes only the habitat type that you are studying uh time of the year or season yes does matter a lot how does this matter time of the day yes definitely how does time of the year matter in your sampling well in some parts of the year the said sample that is bird species may not be very active or may not be abundant in a particular area as opposed to the other season yes correct yeah so uh, this is uh, this is pretty important when it comes to uh, yeah migratory birds right uh, i am not sure what is yeah so uh, migratory birds are uh, found only during certain parts of time in the year in certain areas and uh, if you sample in one place during the migratory season whereas in opposed to uh, the non migratory season in another area you'll find the species richness to be higher during the migratory season in that particular area and attribute a higher richness to that area but in turn it's uh, incorrect because the other area also does receive migratory birds but you've not sampled it during that time uh Yeah, Govan says blitz reed wobbler. I'm not sure about the selection. Oh, the sampling bias that selection bias. I'm I'm not really sure. Um, as an example to what you just mentioned, uh, they in one in you know, in one season they are present solely in and around India, which makes them easier to sample than when they are spread out across Europe. No actually so you won't sample them because you are sampling like for example you are sampling only the shola forest 
uh but the shola forests in like let's say the anamalai palani plateau are very widespread right they are widespread throughout the like there is it's a huge landscape but if you have sampled in kodaikanal side during winter you have found the blitzried warbler there but if you are sampling in uh, near valpara side you won't find the blitzried warbler even if you are sampling there in the summer you won't find the blitzried warbler there but uh, that's not true because the blitzried warbler comes to valpara during winter so you have kind of missed out the presence of the species and uh, this is just one example but then it will be like a lower species richness in valpara as compared to kodaikanal uh because of this bias of sampling period right so you have to make sure that you are sampling so it doesn't really uh much affect birds that are resident species but it definitely if you are doing like a community study or an entire diversity study it should be uh u- uniformly done throughout your landscape otherwise you will have uh yeah some counts looking very high or very low um selection bias stands for bias introduced in the sample due to selection of participants who are not randomly selected okay uh, yeah i'm not sure of that i'm thinking totally genetics uh, okay um, i think observers bias yeah that is i was actually going through the chat really slowly yeah observer bias is really important right uh so uh you need to when you are going out for sampling uh like especially when uh sampling involves a lot of people taking part in it you have to make sure that uh, the observers are able to identify all the species right and you know uh birds are uh not always visible but they are uh, highly vocal so identifying birds by calls is uh, very important uh, for sampling i'm just focusing on like certain areas like for example again forest so in forest the uh, visibility is really low uh, and you must uh, you need to you need to have all the observers participating in your study to be able to identify all your birds that you are targeting if you're doing an entire species diversity of course you need to know all the birds but if you're focusing on particular species of birds you need to make sure that all the observers are proficient in identifying those species by calls because uh, as rusbe mentioned uh, there can be huge observer bias and there can also be misidentification in the case of species that sound very similar so uh, you can also account for observer bias and we ob- uh, we account for observer bias in several studies also when uh the analysis pipelines are done by multiple individuals so f- let's say for example uh you have automated recording units and you're identifying all the species in the automated recording units based on their calls and the spectrograms and you have uh, six to seven people working on it uh you need to calculate an observer bias by giving a a a, a, a sample data set where all the Uh, calls have been identified and then you see how all the seven of these participants are identifying each and every single call in it so there are like a lot of ways in which you can do this mm yeah so yes there are certain species that are more visible and vocal during the breeding season and in conspicuous during the rest of the year that is very true also like they move uh during the breeding and non breeding season like sometimes they'll be in some areas sometimes they'll not be in some areas uh need to find out species richness and i'm interested in that but so i only check the rare sighting and drone number and don't account for their presence uh, okay that is bias there is also reporting bias okay uh yeah <laughs> publication bias reporting bias sure there are a lot of biases but uh, i think everyone let me just connect the screen okay i think everyone gets an idea of uh, what we need to account for during uh, sampling and that's clear 
okay so uh, can someone uh, tell me what is actually distance sampling and why is it important And it's sampling done from a distance. Okay, sure. Uh, what are the types Basically of? Basically, identify the distance of the species. Okay. The angle, and uh, if it's a line transect, then you try to find out the distance from that line and the angle from that line, so that the multiple such line transect that you have planned for the total census or something, you can. collect that data right and, uh, yeah right exactly so uh, vedant has mentioned the type of distance sampling techniques they are line transects and point counts and would anyone like to take a stab at explaining what's happening in the figure out here so this is a line transect uh, line transect ma'am yeah sure um a uh, line uh, a line is placed in a habitat where uh, which has a uniform distribution of birds at the line's placement is random with respect to the birds distribution and and the observer in, looks at a certain bird which which is a certain distance from from uh, from his position mm-hmm. and uh, and his uh, view is also at a certain angle from the line and using uh, trigonometry he uh, uh, he comes to the conclusion of the distance of the bird from the closest point to the line okay yeah and so, uses this method uh, to to basically come make form line transects uh, which include a certain breadth with uh, and all the birds are Identified and in it, the same way. Right. To also elaborate on what Owen uh, said, so the observer spots a bird, measures the distance and the angle, and using that, is able to uh, find out the distance of the bird at uh, I mean perpendicular to that line. To the line. And yes. That also. Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think uh, that is correct. So basically, R is the distance, actual distance from the uh, of the bird from the observer. Then you have theta. That's the uh, angle between the uh, uh, the object that is the bird and uh, sine x for. Well, it's sine theta, right? Well, in this. uh it's just theta yeah you could it, like do sin so theta you, cos theta whatever depends on what you are trying to find out with it's opposite right ma'am x is opposite to theta so i'm using opposite this sin uh no you can't really say anything theta is just the angle that's so it he is trying to uh, derive ha uh, <laughs> <laughs> formula basically wants to be calculated and based on that if it x to be calculated then yeah maybe or r depends because i think on the line we know the distance yeah. and then uh, to some extent we may know that uh, x probably and then you try to find out the r or something whatever sure sure yeah yeah that's yeah that's fine depending on whatever uh, variables you have yes you can calculate whatever you want but uh, the angle of uh, basically the uh, where the detected bird is to the line is represented by theta and then you have the perpendicular distance that is dropped from the uh, bird to the line transect which is x and uh, then you have this other value called uh, w which is the detection distance so you can only detect till a certain distance from the a uh, line transect that you have dropped and uh, this line transect will also so uh, the detection probability also differs from species to species right so yeah um okay so 
so what can distance sampling methods uh, be used for they can be used for uh, measuring abundances they can be used for measuring densities abundances and or densities or distributions distributions would also be fulfilled uh, yeah. yeah if you do like uh, probably like multiple <laughs> distance sampling uh, techniques yeah i was i was i was going for uh, distribution in terms of yeah geographical area but uh, yeah it's it's probably a tool to measure distributions but yeah uh, c is actually the correct answer where uh, you can use distance samplings for um, figuring out abundances and densities could someone explain as to what abundances and densities are Now, abundance refers to the uh, size of the population, and density refers refers to the uh, demographic of the population. Uh, okay. Uh, density would be number of individuals per one of square unit. Yeah, unit and area. Yeah, correct. And the and the demographic. And abundance would be the variety of species or. Uh, yeah, or the yeah the number of individuals, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, okay. So now you uh, you can look at the figure that's taken from the uh, lecture itself and uh, choose the most appropriate option. most appropriate option right you have to choose one option uh, so based on distance sampling techniques uh, the observer here will be able to spot all the individuals on a transect spot some of the individuals on a transect spot some of the individuals based on how they if how far they are from the transect or miss most of the individuals as birds can fly okay so i get why some of you might get confused with this um okay we just wait I should have probably like rephrase this. So I meant spot all individuals during a transect. Does that change anything?
Ma'am, uh, by during a transit, uh, you mean sort all the individuals while making a line transit? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I missed the comment you made. Uh, yeah. So the f so the first option by what I mean is that you are spotting all the individuals during the transit. Oh, it's not on the transit you're saying? Yeah, not on the transit line. Okay. So does that change anything? Okay, I think this just gets worse. Yeah, I so option A actually means if you are spot if you spot all the individuals that are present during your transit, basically. So does the second option also mean that spot some of the individuals during the transit? Yes. I think I should be more um, specific with the uh, yeah the terminology. Uh, okay, so yeah, it's actually uh, option C that is correct because uh, when you're doing li uh, a line transit, you don't spot all the individuals, right? You can never spot all the individuals on a line transit. Uh, yes, you can spot uh, some of the individuals during a line transit, uh, but that is not the most appropriate option. Uh, so you you can spot some of the individuals based on how far they are from the observer, right? Uh, and the further you go, the lesser is your uh, ability to detect certain individuals, right? And it also depends on uh, the size of the individual, how vocal they are, how good uh, the observer is in identifying the species by call or sight, etc. So, yeah, so the actually the correct answer is C. Just to comment here, so is it um, um, logically right to say? Uh, on the on transit or oh, transit? yeah i think uh, the more appropriate thing would be during a transit okay yeah while conducting a transit okay thank you yeah so and i think more specific to why some of you probably would have chosen a uh, the option should be ideally uh, spot all the individuals uh, on the transit line or on the transit path so yeah, then that would be uh, option A. Uh, okay, uh, so which of the following assumptions, uh, oh, sorry, please excuse the typo there, uh, for line transits, uh, again typo, are incorrect. Uh, so the placement of the line is random with respect to the habitat and species. Uh, birds on the line are always detected, observers move slower than birds and there is no measurement in angles and distances.
Okay, so Seventy-one uh, replied. Uh, others that haven't replied, would you like to take a stab at what is the correct option? Okay, so uh, yes, the correct answer is actually C. So could we like discuss these options a little bit? Um, so what do you mean by placement of the line is always random with respect to habitat and species? It means that um, we do not, uh, like for example, for line transit, we do not always keep it along the road or something, right? or uh, it will not be because there is an assumption of maybe uniform distribution of the habitat or whatever so the lines will be uh, placed uh, uh, randomly throughout the habitat so that we sample it uh, correctly yeah and it's not species dependent that okay so certain uh, locations or plums may have uh, some uh, more density of certain species we do not specifically put lines along that uh, plump or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so very often you lay out transects by just uh, getting a image of your, your, like a satellite image of your entire area to be sampled and you lay out these transects without actually going there. So uh, yeah, as Sachin mentioned like roads. Uh, even when you actually visit a landscape, you find a lot of trails and paths. They could be animal trails, they could be man-made trails, depending on if humans are allowed in that area. Uh, there is always uh, an easier way to traverse an area. But uh, if you are doing all your line transects on these particular animal or man-made paths, then that doesn't uh, make it random anymore. So you have to cut through the forest and cut through like uh, understory vegetation to do a uh, line transit that is uh, randomly laid right uh, what about the second assumption second assumption that is that all birds on the line are always detected so what's actually happening here in a, in a line transit um, we want to continue or yeah no, sure go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. okay uh, in a line transect, the all the birds that are found on a very near close to the line transect are all detected. As, that is, the detection probability is a full one. See, they are not missed. Right. Anyone uh, else wants to add anything to this? It is assumed that the people uh, have observational quality so that <laughs> none of those words are missed actually on that line yeah yeah sure yeah uh, if uh, it's highly unlikely that camouflage birds would sit on the floor even if you are quite close to it uh, but uh, yeah this is under the assumption that you do always detect uh, everything that is on the line yeah uh, so what else are the assumptions? Uh, so yes, uh, Govin and uh, Rosebay have uh, corrected the incorrect statement. So C is actually the uh, incorrect assumption. So uh, we actually assume that the, bur mo the bird movement is uh, much slower as compared to the observer movement. And why is that? I mean, is it because the birds are trying to move fast? Yeah, so it's it's under the assumption that while you are doing the transit, like you have already counted the bird and the bird is not, uh, you know, has not left the area before you have encountered it. 
yeah so there is no repeat to count of the same yeah part. so you are uh, you are walking faster than the bird could have moved uh okay and then the final assumption is that uh, there is no measurement error in angles and distances so actually what is the case like there is always some uh, measurement error right and uh, first of all you are using what do you use actually to measure angles and distances what is the instrument इंस्ट्रूमेंट दैट यू यूज आई योर वॉइस इज सॉरी वेरी फेंट yeah sure you can possibly use a compass uh, this was covered during the lecture though what is the instrument used a <laughs> laser distance meter <laughs> sure uh, so these devices are actually called range finders and uh, you basically uh, theodolite I have no idea what that is. Should I Google it? Is it an instrument, Vedam? Light instrument. Okay. Precision optical instrument used for measuring angles between designation measurement. Oh, okay. Wow, this looks huge. Uh, I'm not sure if um. Oh, this is what they use for surveys. Okay, uh, yeah, this I'm seeing an image where uh, I think probably the stopographers or cartographers use this. Uh, but uh, so usually for <laughs> something out of the common, yeah, indeed, right. Uh, so if you Google range finders, you will see this um, uh, small handheld device that has a. Uh, lens and a laser beam and you point it you spot the bird on the tree you point it towards that and you can find the uh, distance and angle at which uh, you are looking at the bird at and what distance it is from so yeah it's a it's a range finder r a n g e f i n d e r range finder yeah um so yeah uh they're just like tiny little things um in your you can just use it in your hand and uh, i'm not sure as to how expensive they are but uh, usually when you do surveys um it also tells you um it can also like uh, based on the angle it can calculate the height at which the birds also are in uh, how far they are in the canopy as well so it's for serving in forestry yeah sure that's probably appropriate and correct uh so yes they are known as uh, range finders right let's go to the next question okay so uh what are the two okay let's say what are the two first uh, distance sampling methods i think this was already mentioned which range finder model do you use uh i'm not really sure we do have an we do have nikon range finders uh i am not sure of the model it's this yellow thing but uh, yeah i could probably like you know what it is called okay so there are um do you still no you we actually don't use any compasses yeah i think that how how do you discover the angle man you can't use the protractor in the field yeah so the range finder gives you the angle 
it uh, it has a digital display and it uh, shows you the angle so you can note it down based on uh, you where you have viewed the bird from from the point mm, okay so uh, so distance sampling techniques include as you have all is the range no it's not a binocular uh, it's a monocular rather uh, it's not uh, yeah it won't give you like great clarity of uh, details of a bird like a binocular but uh, it will definitely uh, show you where the bird is and you can see it uh okay so uh, which of the following statements is true with respect to sampling methods uh with the de- with the increase in distance the number of birds present in uh birds present wow what have i even written with the increase in distance the number of birds present is lower in point counts and higher in line transects with the increase in distance the number of birds present is lower in line transects while the number of birds is higher in point counts and at a closer distance the number of birds present is high in both point counts and line transects and at closer distances uh, the the number of birds present is low in point counts and high in line transects So you have to find out which of the fo- following statements is true. This is talking about just the presence of the species. Okay, we are not talking about detection. We're talking about presence. Okay, so the uh, actual answer for this, in fact, has not been guessed by anyone. It's actually D is true, not B. It's D. Uh, so I'm actually going to uh, pull up the graphs in the next slide. So we'll we'll get back to this once we see these. Mm, so uh, looking at these two graphs could you tell me which are the types of sampling techniques that have been used uh, graph like what could you what were the options was did it say number of birds the number of birds cited yes it's not talking about the probability right yeah i'm just talking about presence right right 
so how how it can be increase uh, or higher in both the counts at the closer distances i mean if we consider the uniform distribution also oh how does so that yeah so when you actually do point counts uh, there are the the further you go away from the point the higher the number of birds are present so right. uh, so so at closer distances the birds present is lower in point counts and higher in line transects ma'am there's the listen it's in the option b the same it says the increase in distance uh, the number of birds is higher in point counts well uh, while it progressively becomes lower in uh, no with the distance. increase in distance the number of birds increases in both uh, point counts and line transects yeah so i that's what i just wanted to show this uh, graph so that uh, you can make out so uh, could, could you tell me like which of the graphs is for point counts and which is for line transits ma'am but uh, the option say that it increases or decreases in line transits but uh, according to the graph it says uh, it, it's constant there's no constant option uh increase in distance from or off transit uh with the increase in distance from the transit does the number of birds uh present uh the number of birds present is lower in line transits while the number of birds present is higher in point counts so if you look at the graph and you see with the increase in distance from both uh while doing point counts or line transits the number of birds increases right in fact the number of birds is constantly high in uh, uh line transects so this is the graph showing line transects and this is the graph showing um uh point counts right with the increase in, so uh, what's happening is that the presence of birds are actually the same across different distances in line transects but the detection probability decreases right is that is this part clear let detection probability in anyway decreases in both the transits right yes it decreases yeah. in both the transits but yeah. if you see the detection probability is uh, bound by the number of birds that are present in the point counts right so in a point count you have lesser number of birds near the point and number of birds increase as you go away from the point right like i agree to the fact that it will always increase when you take into consideration the higher higher uh, area into consideration right from the transect sure so right. so that's why i mean option b is uh, not correct right because you are saying that the number with the increase in distance the number of birds presence is lower in a line transect while the number really? of birds is higher in point counts correct Correct. Yeah. So that statement is false. Why? Then, uh, sorry. Why? Because the, the the same distance increase in line transect mm. may not add that many birds compared to the line uh, point transect, right? Okay. So you're not comparing between line transects and point counts. We are just talking about with the increase in distance, does the number of birds present? So we are talking about uh, with the increase and decrease in distance. with answer. respect to the presence of birds okay, but what is the correct answer yeah, the correct answer is c c so c at closer distances the number of birds present is lower in point counts and higher in line transects we're talking about presence okay so if you look at the graph out here uh, if you see the line transect graph out here you will see that as you are the closer you are to uh, the line this is the number of birds that are present right let's say like whatever 14 but uh, if you are at a point the number of birds is really low near at the point where you are standing at distance 0 and the birds increase as you move away from the point now sorry you don't move away from the point your vision moves away from the point right okay and that's why our argument work against c as well because we're not comparing uh, 
the line stand that you point out number is three as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, so but so so you don't yeah. see a high number of birds in uh, in point counts near the near the point. But again, in line stand it's it's not it's not higher or lower. It remains constant throughout. So shouldn't the option be constant? नंबर ऑफ बर्ड प्रेजेंट इज लो एंड पॉइंट काउंट एंड well then what what will you say with respect to what and constant with respect to and is constant across different distances in line transects yeah so did you say the correct answer is d or c a <laughs> d uh, okay yeah c is anyway uh, incorrect because you don't have a high number of individuals close to points during point counts And that's why I got confused because earlier I heard C, so that's why I was confused. Oh no no no! I sorry. I it it's D. It's D. Uh, why is this so? I'm not sure. Vedang, what was that question? Uh, is the question about detection probability of the presence of birds? Yeah, it was the presence of birds. And uh, what you basically mean to say is that the uh, uh, in the point count, the area covered for the given red eye. is radius is lesser compared to the line transect and that's why you will have lesser number of birds right so yeah so i mean would uh, anyone like to take a stab at explaining both the graphs ma'am could i try yeah sure please go ahead Yeah, the first graph which represents line transects, the number of the actual number of birds throughout the transect is relative is more or less constant. It does not increase or decrease. And uh, however, the number of birds detected or seen by a person's vision gradually decreases with uh, decreases with respect to the increase in distance. Right. Whereas when it comes to point counts, the number of uh, birds at the beginning. is very low and progressively becomes higher with the with the increase in, uh, area increase in distance and increase in area of this point counts whereas uh, whereas the number of uh, uh, number of birds actually detected uh, also goes down so while in the first graph it uh, starts high uh, with a the highest point starts in the beginning and slowly slopes downward in the second graph it start uh, it starts out low there's a there's a peak or crest in an intermediate point where the uh, where both the distance and the vision of the said person uh, both come together in the intermediate point and then it slowly again slopes down due to increase in distance right yeah so uh, yeah so i think uh, govind has explained it uh, quite clearly so uh, yeah vedang has also figured it out so yes you are actually looking at a radial uh, survey when you're doing a point count and uh, yes as the radius increases your area increases and uh, the number of birds present uh, definitely will increase and you usually do um, uh, well let's cover that later um, but yes so the so near you you will probably find the least number of birds because the uh, detection radius is uh, really um, small as compared to line transects where you are actually looking at well uh, you actually don't have uh, angles in uh, point counts because you are only measuring like a radial distance from the point right so you will have like different circles of different areas uh, an angle doesn't matter because it is not on a line 
and uh, your detection probability in um, a point count uh, increases till a particular distance and then drops because you can't really see uh, or identify all the number of individuals beyond a certain distance and uh, at further distances what is happening is that you're seeing very few uh, individuals because your detection probability due to sight is uh, decreasing as well as the number of birds of course are increasing like a lot so uh, yeah there is a complete opposite trend that is happening at uh, larger distances from a point when you do a point count and uh, so uh, why do people actually do point counts sometimes the terrain will be difficult for a line transit to pass through like a mountainous area or something right like kind of thing. so at that point they will try to go for point transit so that you do a radial survey and then estimate right yeah. it might be more favorable when the population is ओके Like colony that. nesting birds like okay colony Ganes nesting or, birds sure gannets or penguins sure 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 maybe the static kind of uh, birds if it's more yeah while they will go for the line transect or something sure sure and when would you uh, yeah so when would you choose uh, line transects so the density is slightly sparser or uh, in uniform and the habitat is very large right and the species are uh, slightly mobile the right. habitat is also even yeah even and large are correct right yeah so it's uh, very difficult to do uh, if you have a huge area to cover it is uh, point counts don't really enable you to cover like a large area and if you're for example if you're doing it in a forest uh what would you kind of choose point like transect I mean, right. depending on the terrain right? yeah depending on the terrain again right so if it is a forest across a uh, a huge uh, elevational gradient or a or a huge slope where you can't really conduct any line transect uh, you would go for point counts so there are a lot like a lot of things that you need to account for and the length of the transit will definitely depend on your study design and de- it depends on uh, which species also you're uh, choosing right so uh, line transects are done for some things from like large mammals to uh, vegetation so it it really depends on what and the observers Well, which method is more practically used when searching for birds? Uh, it so it again it again depends. So there are a lot of studies that use point counts, and there are a lot of studies that use line transects, and it again depends on what you are studying. What is your question? So for example, if you are looking at uh, mixed species foraging flocks, you'll probably look. Uh, you would maybe do uh, point counts. and uh, if you are doing like a general survey of uh, measuring diversity of birds uh, in a particular uh, habitat or nature reserve or something you would probably do line transects so yeah i think it totally depends on the question that you are asking can the the width of or the the line transect can can it depend on the observer cap- capability uh i i think it will again depend on the uh, the species right so if i, I sp- understand about that but yeah. what i'm trying to say is that if there is a group of 
expert versus the group of amateur who are going for obviously there will be an expert but to some extent if for some particular sampling event they have got some experts who are able to identify maybe up to only uh, 20 meter or 50 meter right will, will they then modify the distance to that range um yeah i think this is like a little bit tricky so when you're doing a study design you would keep everything constant you wouldn't alter the widths based on who it is but uh, you can probably account for biases like if you're doing some uh, generalized linear mix model or some kind of thing you will account for observer and then you will see uh, uh, which are the observers that uh, bring in a high degree of variability right and you you can account for that but uh, for study design you would keep the width as constant in so my opinion across different events of a sampling in a particular habitat the uh-huh. line uh, the distance for that line transit will always remain same correct oh. correct yeah yeah, yeah. It, it ideally should not be variable because uh, then it's then 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 you have to account for the length of the line also right because you're if you're doing like a 200 meter transect it has to be 200 meters every uh, like if you're doing like random sampling or even uniform sampling it has to be like spaced out and there is no point doing a 200 meter line transect like this right next to another 200 meter line transect right like so you have to account for that width also so that you're not like it's not a pseudo replicate so i think they are yeah it uh, i mean like really uh, good questions and interesting questions that uh, everyone is asking out here but uh, you see like when you think of more things then you realize how you need to uh, design your study and uh, yeah ways in which you can avoid pseudo replication and conduct a more robust study and this also comes from actually people who have done these transects and realized that uh, this is not the best way to do this this is not the best way to uh, study this particular taxa like for example if i'm doing uh, squirrels versus birds i can't probably use the uh, same methodology right because uh, yeah they are two different uh, taxa altogether and they have different uh, they they have different behaviors so yeah you need to account for everything during study design Okay, I'll just uh, go to the next question. Uh, okay, so during uh, misnetting, it is possible to get an idea of which of the following characteristics of a bird when it is in the hand. So, could someone uh, take a start by explaining what is actually misnetting? Should have actually put an image oh, here. Okay. is a uh, arrangement of a series of nests, nets across uh, a habitat where there is usually a flow of the bird, mm-hmm. which is predicted. And uh, ideally, they'll be um, aligned horizontally one on top of each other. The height might be like, I think, you know, 5, 10 feet per net or something. I don't remember exactly. And depending on the bird, the size of the net, um, I mean the hole, will be varying. Obviously, it's used mostly for the smaller birds, if I remember correctly. It can be used for larger birds also, but they'll be having at a higher canopy and that net will be at a higher location. Okay. As I understand. Right. Uh, so, there'll be poles uh, on the two sides which will be holding those nets, uh, nets uh, together and then, yeah, that's how it is done. Okay. Yeah, so uh, would anyone else uh, also like to maybe add on if there is anything towards such an explain right now? Well, uh, misnet is a way of uh, doing detailed, uh, detailed survey on a small uh, or uh, small population of birds or in a small location right now. Uh, you can also cover larger locations, but uh, again, it will be you will be uh, putting your uh, nets in a certain fashion, right? So, uh, as Sachin was explaining, so you usually yes, you do get nets of various lengths. 
they can range from 2 meter nets to 6 meter nets to uh, 12 meter nets 15 meter nets uh, usually the standard uh, most commonly used net size is uh, about um, 12 meters 10 to 12 12 meters usually and uh, as Sachin explained it's extended between two poles so these nets uh, usually a traditional or the common mist nets have about uh, four shelves four shelves means it is like four layers of uh, mist net and it extends to about uh, four and a half meters high so it again depends upon the type of bird you are catching you will put your nets higher or lower so the net will be like laid out so you will have two poles like this and then your net will come here but if you want to catch understory birds or birds that hop on the ground you will put your nets uh, the last shelf of the net really low but if you are trying to catch birds in uh, the mid story you will probably put your nets really high because uh, the like on the pole of course it will only go till four and a half meters and these birds will come and they will uh, as they fly through the area they will fall into the nets and it will it's like it's a net that is really baggy so these uh, birds will fall into these pockets and um, mist netting is a process that you need to be trained in and uh, you uh, in certain other countries like the US and Europe you can get certifications for being for conducting mist netting so you have the um, I think it's the Safring or uh, some society like this in the US and then you have the uh, British Trust of Ornithology and the RSPB that conducts uh, mist netting in the UK and you have uh, another body in Europe that uh, enables you to learn mist netting so basically during mist netting these you have to put the nets in india okay <laughs> so in india we do not have a uh, uniform body that produces uh, or conducts mist netting activities um, certain research groups do mist netting for partic to answer particular questions but uh, there is no such central organization uh, the uh, Bombay Natural History Society BNHS in India does uh, used to conduct uh, bird ringing workshops mostly for waders not really for forest birds and the way they catch waders sometimes is a little bit different from mist netting but sometimes they also do use mist nets but uh, yeah in India there is no such uh, uh, single body that uh, trains people to do this. Uh, so usually if you need to do a study that uh, requires mist netting and you are in a lab that uh, practices uh, mist netting then you yeah you will need to do mist netting to answer your questions so uh, yeah so what i wanted to say was um, these birds are not at all harmed during the process because they fall into these pockets and the mist net sizes are highly variable so you have uh, if you want to catch uh, larger birds uh, you will have a little larger mist net uh, the uh, the net size but if you have smaller birds the net size will be the mesh size will be really small so what happens if you have larger birds that fall into the mist net they'll uh, they have the tendency of not getting caught or trapped and they can straight away run out but you do find large birds such as raptors that do happen to fall into these mist nets and you need to put mist nets in such a location where there is a high degree of bird movement right and uh, where could anyone guess where you could have a very high degree of bird movement in a forest um, water source yeah water source short uh, near river beds yes Rooting trees. Uh, uh, so, sorry, Sachin, what did you mention? Rooting trees. Protein trees. Oh, fruiting trees. Uh, sure. Fruiting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, fruiting trees. Um, um, you, what, what would fruiting trees bring you? 
like in terms of bird community food basically right uh, food and insect oh in yeah right so if you put your nets near uh, fruiting trees you won't get the insectivorous birds there yeah i mean to say that uh, basically it's mainly the foraging related uh, uh, resources which can be useful to put the states sure sure clearing uh, area yeah yeah that's actually that's actually true so uh, when you do mist netting if you do mist netting on paths uh, you have the highest movement of birds uh, on uh, trails or yeah, paths, paths usually right or at the edges of the forest the, the edges of the forest you have the highest movement so uh, especially for certain species um, uh if you put it on the forest edge you will catch more number of individuals than uh, inside the forest so sometimes you can sit for hours inside the forest with nets and uh, catch maybe one bird in the entire day but if you put it on the edge of the forest you will have such high movement you will have about like 40 to 50 birds probably in a day so uh, the positioning of your mist nets uh, really really is crucial and uh, it it depends on if you want to do something like a target capture where you need this particular species only uh, you will have to very wisely put your nets right um okay why why is it uh, higher probability to be on the edges of the forest what is the reason for that uh i'm i'm not really sure so in clearings and edge of the uh, edges of the forest uh, you usually have the highest movement so for some reason they are used as crossing over paths i i are they actually trying to a bird would require clearing to fly right now uh not really they can fly through the trees it's not so dense but uh, so you also need to take into account like um, 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 what do you say feasibility so of entering the forest right so they would uh, they would prefer clearings with them uh, they so certain birds do prefer clearings because uh, like let's say for example uh, if they are feeding on uh, i don't know if the vegetation near the edges of the forest have higher resources of i'm just hypothesizing of fruiting uh, trees or uh, there are more number of uh, insects that are present on paths or roads or worms i, I, I i'm not really sure i'm have not really sure have you ever tried investigating man Yes, yes. We uh, like a lot of our projects that we do in our lab involve mist netting because uh, we collect a lot of. So as we were getting into actually the question that is given out here, uh, so could you could like anybody like cover the following points of the birds in the hand? Yeah. So I think yeah, everybody more or less. agrees to uh, a b d e f g okay yeah anyone can go ahead now my answer is include everything except c yeah so does anyone know how do we take these measurements so body mass will be through the some measuring scale right Yeah, correct. So would be ma'am. Uh, what the metric machine? Measurement is the leg yeah. size, the tail size, the beak size. Yeah, actually, I should have uh, put pictures in this of all the tools. So yes, as you correctly mentioned, body mass can be measured by a scale. You can usually use two types of scales. One is like a weighing balance, like a digital weighing balance, where you can put the bird in a container that it won't fly out from. uh on the weighing balance or you have these pesola weighing scales which are a spring balance so uh, uh it's a, like a spring balance kind of thing and you put the bird the birds are usually put in bird bags and you can suspend the bird in the bird bag or a measuring cone and uh, weigh the bird yeah so for uh, do yeah. they fly within that bag uh no actually so what these are like loose uh, i seriously should have put uh, photos out here because this is quite exciting uh, so you usually have cotton bags 
that are uh, quite large and we just make a simple knot uh, on the top with the string and so you just gather it it's like a nada kind of thing where you gather it and then you just tie a knot and then you just suspend the bird like that with the spring balance or you keep it on the uh, digital weighing balance in a box that is uh, already weighed earlier so yeah they don't i understood, I understood this back concept but what i'm trying to understand whether whether the bird really tries to fly within that bag or not Oh, uh sure. If so the birds usually from whatever my experience is they they are quite calm inside the bag because it's dark and they are like suspended. Unless they are super fidgety birds, uh they don't really like move around a lot, but sometimes yes, they do happen to jump out of the box or if they are too large, they like uh manage to jump out of the weighing scale or something because, like that because that may impact the measurement of the weight right sure so sure yes then you have to remeasure it so uh, usually with these weighing balances that are suspended uh, we kind of hold them till it stabilizes and then you anyway get the weight because it is a spring balance and uh, for a digital weighing scale you'll probably if it's like a larger bird then you'll put it in a larger container so that it can't really you know move around or observe it uh, move around or uh, alter the observe observations a lot and also you record measurements uh, of weight till um, like the accuracy is till about uh, two decimal points or three decimal points so we try and minimize for as much error as possible and also if you have multiple individuals you do get an idea of what the um, range could be of yeah uh so yes morphometric measurements are really important uh, do you know what all morphometric measurements are taken for birds beak size okay so in beak size you have several categories as well upper beak size lower beak size uh uh not particularly ah that's interesting uh, no we haven't actually accounted for curvature <laughs> but uh but uh, yeah we can take measurements of so you usually use vernier calipers to measure bill uh, take bill measurements width yes length. correct correct bill width length. bill length and then you take bill height so you get all height. the three dimensions yeah okay so then what else what else can you measure you have the total length sharpness primary secondary Uh, tertiary feather length. Yeah. The What about big sharpness? Uh, I don't think you can measure that on a scale. Legs. Uh, right. Uh, then tongue length. Ah, uh, yeah. So as Sachin was mentioning, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So you have like a scale known as a wing ruler, which is actually it. Uh, you can place the wing. against the ruler like this and then you can take a measurement uh, so yes you take primaries and secondaries and why are primaries and secondary lengths important related to their flight yes identification uh age to some extent but age mostly during uh, for molt score but uh, primary and secondary lengths are really important because you can calculate something known as the hand wing index right and uh, i'm sure this has been probably uh, covered in uh, yes is age it same of the wings span sorry is it same as the wings span not not wings span this is called as a hand wing index hwi and it usually can tell you about how far a bird can disperse so are they long distance dispersers are they short distance dispersers do they migrate do they not migrate So if the hand wing index is uh, very high, like uh, all of you can like Google this up. I'm not going to cover it. Degree is indicating what is the flight type or category type. Yes, correct. So if you compare uh, uh, long distance migratory birds versus uh, birds that don't migrate at all, you will see uh, differences in the hand wing index, right? Uh, uh, between species. Okay. Between species. Within species, 
uh, you might find the ratio of hand wing index to be very similar but wing lengths will uh, differ and it can differ between even like the sexes so males and females can have different morphometric values in different species itself so um, um, like for by, the yeah by wing sorry sorry uh okay so uh, actually uh, so like for the white bellied sholakili which is a bird that i s- uh, study and that has been extensively studied by uh, dr robin uh, earlier uh, what he saw was that um, the just so they are uh, monomorphic in nature right like both the males and the females look the same but he Uh, took morphometric measurements of a number of males and a number of females and he found that uh, males had a longer wing length and it fell within a certain range and females had a shorter wing length and uh, similar to that like in several different species studies have been done so morphometrics yes they don't give you uh like they might give you a roundabout estimate of whether it could be a male or a female but uh, to find out the sex of the bird uh, it's probably just better to do molecularly uh, to molecularly sex them or if you are able to uh, identify like the cloaca or the cloacal protuberance uh, i i'm not sure of those methods you can make out if they are male or female during the breeding season but uh, in terms of other morphological measurements you can also take yeah the one of the major things is tarsus length so you can't men- measure the entire foot but you can measure the tarsi so both the tarsi the left tarsi and the right tarsi so yeah these are like some basic morphometric measurements that you can take uh type of endoparasite so all of you agree that endoparasites can't be measured Not within the head or open, I think uh, you may need no, to take some samples, right? Right. And then you study in the laboratory. Blood samples and things. You, I mean, that would be possible. Like, yeah, yes. You when you catch yes. Them. Yes. Correct. Correct. Not on field, but you will collect blood samples that uh, will give you an uh, idea of uh, endoparasitic myeloid. Yeah. Mm, type of ectoparasites yes you can find out because you can see mites on the wings of the birds or legs or body or where they are positioned you can also collect mite samples and examine them later uh, breeding condition uh, what what is an indicator of breeding condition the colors or the body uh, bodily changes yes uh, colors yes surely what are these bodily changes could it be age and fitness Uh, age uh, is not usually very clear unless they are like migratory species and you can measure like a molt score which is basically the number of feathers or that are molting and then you have like molt scores for primaries from 0 to 10 etc etc but what? breeding condition is denoted by what no what about maturity man uh, yeah exactly so you can make that out by plumage so if they are uh, juveniles you will have a different plumage if they are adults you will have a different plumage in most species but yeah molt score for migratory birds can tell you the age as well for what about breeding condition does anyone have any idea you mean the just from the observation of the body yes. thing or yes, the correct. plumage you are saying uh sure that includes uh, observation of the body plumage you are correct in that also but if they are uh, birds that don't undergo uh, vast changes during the breeding season in their plumage how do you how could you know if they are breeding or not average weight might be different uh, weight, what weight might, average weight might be different during the breeding time or uh, uh, anything yeah, so not a sure short indicator but possibly maybe not yeah maybe not too much but yeah what else what else hormonal yeah. profile is a- again uh behavior uh behavior as in uh say a male might be more vocal or active when say sure. shot or more aggressive but uh, you haven't spent time observing the bird you have just caught the bird in your hand in the mist net i have never done this so i'm asking you uh no so i'm telling 
i'm telling you so you are you don't get an op- uh, you don't like or i don't get the opportunity to observe a bird when it's in the net uh just by having the bird in my hand after taking it from the mist net how do i how do i know if it is breeding or not whatever be the species to some extent there is the morphological change so it's more pronounced in say pheasant tail jacana where there is a tail that is developed but even in a bulbul say a red vented bulbul the vent color will be darker during the breeding season than in the non breeding season okay all birds will exhibit some kind of morphological change okay sure during the breeding season sure even if you take larks which are very plain plain colored birds the lords are darker during the breeding season than in the non breeding season okay. other than that there are no changes but okay but there is some minor change or the okay. other <laughs> okay so a major change that happens during the breeding season for birds that are breeding is that they have a brood patch okay and uh, this brood patch is basically uh, they lose all their feathers in the belly to increase the uh, surface area of heat contact with the eggs as they incubate right so uh, if you see the belly of the birds because they are in the hand when you are mist netting you see uh, that their uh, belly area is completely uh, it doesn't have any feathers on it absolutely no feathers on it and it has a really uh, you can see fat deposits so these fat deposits increase the amount of insulation and the bare belly increases the contact between the eggs and the individual sitting on top of it to incubate and uh, it it maintains the heat out there right so uh, i can what would this be seen in males also uh, in in males that incubate yes but in males that don't incubate mostly it is the females in birds that uh, participate in uh, incubating uh, activities uh, you will see it only in the females yeah basically you like it by if if of uh, brood patch is present it's this is basically most likely a female and the uh, almost likely that it's a uh, breeding yeah yeah so in a population like if you are sampling like one particular so if i'm if so during mist netting you capture any number of birds right any number of species you if you find at least like two or three of them uh of the 10 individuals of that species that have a brood patch you can say okay yes these birds are breeding this is the breeding season for the species but uh, as opposed to another species that i catch and it does not if i've got 20 individual of those and none of them have a brood patch i could make like a kind of assumption that these birds are not this species is not breeding during this period yeah uh yes govin yeah, yes ma'am i was my question was uh, are animals that are not all birds that feed in those breeders right in year round what about those kind of birds which is not uh like for example pigeon i guess i am i'm not really sure they probably have uh, i don't think they are year round breeders uh but uh, yeah probably during the incubation period they would have uh, a brood patch and as the chicks hatch they'll start regrowing their feathers so you will see like certain pin feathers that are growing out of it and it usually is post breeding season so uh, observing the belly throughout the year uh, if you are observing at least like the same individual that you know for sure was breeding and is not breeding now you will see these changes in the belly uh okay so gender yeah we have already discussed and age why am old score also uh, yeah we covered so there are a lot of things that you can do in the hand uh okay we are almost out of time let's uh, let's go on to a problem question i mean numerical question okay so you are estimating the population of black and orange flycatchers in the shola sky island this is an image of a black and orange flycatcher that is in a mist net uh and using this mist net you catch uh oh uh the technique you will be using is called a what method capture release capture mark capture mark recapture <laughs> mark recapture yes that is correct yeah it is known as a mark recapture method 
and uh, using this method you catch 12 individuals in year 1 and you put a metal ring around them in year 2 you return and you catch 16 individuals and this includes six of the individuals that were previously ring so given this information provided what do you think is the population size of the species in this particular area so you need to do some little bit of minor calculations it's very easy maybe you can start putting in your answers and then we can like briefly discuss you can just use a calculator Incubation patch and brood patch are synonymous. Yes, yes, Abhishek. Okay. Is anyone stuck? Okay, Harini says B. Okay, Sachin says B. Okay, so Sachin has uh, uh, helped everyone out there. So, what is the formula again? Yeah, so Sachin's actually put the formula. Let me just uh, bring it up on the screen as well. So, your formula is uh, out here. Uh, so, would someone like to? So, Sachin's already put it. Harni, would you like to explain what uh, you had do, you have done? Okay, same formula. Good. Uh, yeah, would anyone like to explain what is M N R N here? Yeah. So we basically keep uh, we're recapturing, as it indicates, we capture, mark, and then recapture. So there are two. For example, in this example, there are two recap two captures happening. In the first instance, we are assuming that the total population is capital M. Out of that, we captured M, which is twelve. And in next year, we captured actually 16 individuals. Out of that, six were ring, which is R. Right. And the next year capture is actually 16, which is small n. Right. So yeah, so you can just do uh, the substitution of the values as Sachin has already shown, and uh, you can get the answer of 32. Right. So uh, this is the way of doing mark and recapture and what are the things that you need to uh, remember while doing mark and recapture? I think it, it will risk. Uh, sorry Sachin? Yeah, what I was saying is that it will be related to, I think many assumptions uh, related to misnetting or the capture will be applicable here. Right. That whether we are putting the right, uh, using the right place for capturing, sure. and then the season is correct, and yeah. uh, then we need to have multiple samples taken, not just 
one or two captures that may help us. Sure. We need to study across the timeline. Yeah. Uh, for to uh, have a reliable result. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So if you have done mist netting for three days during year one, you have to do mist netting during the similar season in year two for this. Also, and when you are putting up, yeah. And there will be and some other about the one, one, one second. Uh, one, yeah, one of you. Yeah, Sachin. We can yeah. confine our uh, misnets to one place only. We should try to use it in other areas as well if possible. Oh, yeah. So you have brought up a really important point. So when you are doing misnetting across years, you have to. So if I have used 10 nets. When I come back in year two, I have to put those 10 nets in the exact location as I put them in year one. So this is how the mark recapture uh, framework is done. It has to be in exactly the same place, in the same direction, in the same angle. So if I put net one like this in year one, net one has to be like this in this location in year two. So these are a few things that you do need to take into account while doing uh, mark and recapture. And uh, Dr. Umesh's lab has done mark and recapture in the Northeast for several years uh, since uh, I think 2011. And there are such cool papers that they have published or that are in bio archives. So I uh, do encourage uh, you all to go and read them. Yeah. Have you ever worked in the Northeast? No? Oh, no, no, I haven't worked in the Northeast, only in the Shola Sky Islands, yeah. So only in Western Guards? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, Alright, I think we are up with time. I hope all of you have gotten an idea of uh, Mark and Recapture uh, with this. So, um, yeah, let's uh, all catch up next week and thanks for joining in today. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Bye.